Today is January 4th, 2012. This is the finishing up of the 8-3 lecture. We finished yesterday with a procedure for looking up T star values from the T table, table B. Remember, whenever we're asked to do a confidence interval, we have to be given a confidence level. Those confidence levels are found at the bottom of the T table. Also, when we're doing this particular procedure, meaning we don't know what sigma is, and we're relying on using the value of S, the sample standard deviation, that that will allow us to calculate the degrees of freedom. Remember that the formula is that the degrees of freedom is equal to the sample size minus one. That combination of confidence interval and degrees of freedom allow us to find the intersection, which will be our T star value. Once we have that, we should have all the pieces that allow us to calculate a confidence interval. Yes? It's a very good question. Um, I'll show you how to do it on the calculator as well. All right? Um, and then I'm also going to explain why you're likely to get different answers from using the table procedure or the calculator because of the limitations of the table. All right, but I'll get to, I'll get to the calculator as well. All right, so let's put all the pieces together for the confidence interval calculation. Just like with proportions, we have this thing called the standard error. The standard error is going to be the standard deviation of the sample divided by the square root of n. Remember that this is similar to the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, and we use it only because we don't know what sigma is, because we hardly ever know what's going on at the population level. This is what we would like, this is what we would like to use, and then we can use z star in the absence of knowing sigma, we will settle for the standard error. And of course, if we use standard error, now we're stuck in using the T procedures and using the T table. So, to find the confidence interval for mu, meaning we're hoping to create a confidence interval, an interval of values which most of the time will have in it mu. We're going to um, place the standard deviation. Okay, we're going to use standard error instead of standard deviation. We're going to use the critical value that comes from the t table instead of the one that comes from the from the z-table or from the bottom row of the t-table, and then our confidence interval has the formula x-bar plus or minus t-star multiplied by s divided by root n. I'm sorry. people require more time on this slide? No one? Okay. I'm just going to add a real quick blank slide because I just want to do a, a quick compare and contrast. So if we want to estimate, if we want to find an interval that captures mu, our first choice is this formula.
That's our first choice. If I give you sigma, you need to use the Z procedure in that formula. But since we often don't have sigma, we are stuck. with that version of the formula. And again, it's a second place finisher. Okay, remember, T stars depend on both confidence level and degrees of freedom. Are there any questions? Is this in the formula sheets? Yes. And the answer is, no, it isn't. But you take out, everyone take out their formula sheets real quickly. And let me show you where where it's kind of there. I'm trying to decide whether it's more painful for me to speak or more painful for you to hear. Are we all being equally pained? Okay, now, Rachel asks, where is this on the formula sheets? And it isn't. Pieces of it are there. We are told on the formula sheet, and I'll write this in black because it's close to what's on the formula sheet. on the formula sheet, very top of the box, the sheet with the boxes. You'll find that. Yep. Okay, oh, sorry. It doesn't use the word estimate. It uses a statistic. It uses the word statistic. All right. All right. So that's item number one. Both of these formulas follow this pattern. Agreed? X bar is our statistic. T star or Z star is our critical value. And these are, this is the standard deviation of X bar. This is a replacement for the standard deviation of X bar. This part here is on your formula sheet. Did anyone find it? It says uh, single sample, standard deviation, sample mean. So, this is on the formula sheet, this is on the formula sheet, and this is a decent replacement when we don't know sigma. Rachel, did that answer your question? Yeah. All right. Let's continue on. So, to summarize what we've got so far. If we use this procedure to find the interval that we hope will capture mu, it doesn't come for free. Like the stuff that we've done before, we have a condition or a set of conditions that we expect to be fulfilled before we can legitimately say our calculation gives us something beneficial. These three conditions which again, I want you to put in step two of a four-step process, are not unfamiliar to you. Is our sampling unbiased? We want our sample to be representative of the population. Of course, the best way to achieve that is, again, simple random sample, not always doable. We'll, satis we'll be satisfied with random sample. Is our sample normal? Or is our sample size large enough that the central limit theorem will help us out with the normality? So we've got this normal condition breaks out into two pieces. First, if our sample size is small, you need to do 
either a box and whisker plot or a step plot of the data to confirm that the sample looks normal. We use that as evidence that the population is normal. If the sample size is large, meaning bigger than 30, we don't worry about it. The central minimum theorem ensures that the t distribution will be approximate, or that the sampling distribution, actually, if the t distribution will be approximately normal. So it's an either or. Small sample size, you've got to confirm it, or large sample size, and you're good. And then lastly, we still need our, our standard deviation formulas are still dependent on the, or are written based on the um, assumption of independence. Again, we ensure independence by making sure that the, the population is much, much larger than our sample. How much larger? At least 10 times larger. So those three conditions come again. And again, I want you to be putting these in step two of our four-step process. Does anyone require more time on this slide? Okay, hearing, hearing no comments. So, I think I've already said these things. <coughs> yes? Okay. Would you please note this notation here? <coughs> Remember, there's not one, there's not one T distribution. There are infinitely many T distributions, all varying slightly. All when N is low or when degrees of freedom low, they're much wider and have more in the tail. It is degrees of freedom gets bigger, the hump in the middle gets taller, and the stuff in the tails get smaller. And as the degrees of freedom approach infinity, the T distribution approximates the, no the normal distribution, the Z distribution. All right. May I go to the next slide? You guys are being merciful to me. Thank you. So, we want to do an um, example that's on page, do I not have a book? It's on page 508. I believe it has to do with the tensions in old uh, uh, computer monitors. Um, surprised you didn't get the data. Okay, so in this particular case, in this particular case, they give us the raw data. Okay, they, they give us um, the data collected from a sample of size 20. So now, um, let me start up my calculator. This is the part where we're going to do some on the calculator, some on the table, we're going to compare. So everyone should get their calculator out. I also need you to get your T, your T table out as well. getting these numbers from the book. Um, know what I want you to do? Um, don't worry about getting these numbers for right now. I'll get them for you 
and then I'm going to I want you to watch the procedure, right? And then I'm going to fill in some gaps. Okay, so you can imagine that you work in quality control for some factory. You can imagine that you pull a sample of 20 items off the line and you test them in some way. Their thickness, their ability to conduct electricity, in this case, the tensions, the tension of this wire mesh that's in this, uh, this monitor. And you have data. You have raw data. Now, if you want to calculate what you think, based on this data, the real average is, meaning, what if we not tested 20? What if we tested all of them? We could then use the T procedure. Now, if you remember from the confidence interval formula, what are these things that we need to know? What's X bar again? Sample mean. From putting this in the calculator, can we get the sample mean out? One bar stats. Is there anything else we get out of one bar stats? S of X. S of X, the standard deviation. We get that out of one bar stats. What's N? 20, or sample size in this case. Sorry, sample size, or 20 in this case. And what's T star? Again, T star is a combination of what confidence you want and how many degrees of freedom you want. How many degrees of freedom do we have in this case? 19. So let's look on your table. 19 degrees of freedom. What confidence level do we want in this case? 90. So would you please find the combination of 19 degrees of freedom and 90% confidence? And what do you get? 1.729 says Kyle. Agree? All right, so we have all the elements that make this up. Let's go ahead and let's get out of one bar stats, the X bar and the S of X. Let's see, um, stat, stat, calc, one bar stat, L1. Okay, so our X bar is 306, our S of X, is 36.2 and now we have all the elements that will make up that calculation. Degrees of freedom is always one smaller than the sample size. We have a sample size of 20 so the degrees of freedom is 19. Was that your question? Okay. Now, we've got the basics of this idea but I still need for, I need to force you into this four-step process. I don't know if I told you that I taught the class, this class for four or five years, and then I attended a training seminar in which, in which an uh, instructor who was very, his students were very, very su successful on the AP exam showed this. I'm like, oh my gosh, I did this, and next year, like, my my scores rose by a full point. I know this feels constricting, okay, but I want you to do it anyway. 
Now they do it. In, um, <clears throat> they're gonna do it like like a, like a like a an outline. Um, I would prefer. Where are my tools? Want to create another slide. <clears throat> Okay, we're just going to do it on this slide. There they are. When you do the four step process, yep, I want you to make the boxes. Okay, step one. What are we trying to do? How are we going to do it? Find mu or in this case it's CRT screen tension or something like that. No one else is a good idea in step one. L. Now I'm not gonna do it that way. Never mind. Step two, what are, what are the, well, let's call this the how and the conditions. How are we going to calculate this mu? We're going to do it using something called a T interval. What are the conditions? Same old, same old. Unbiased. Are we unbiased in this case? Are we? Are we unbiased? How do you know? Did I say it was a simple random sample? I didn't. Okay, so here's your choice. If I don't say simple random sample, may you assume? If I don't say it's a simple random sample, may you assume that it, that it is? No. no, you may not. Let me read the problem. Let's find out. It says a random sample. Is it unbiased? It's a random sample. So I'm going to give it a check mark. I'm OK. What was the other conditions? Normal. <clears throat> How can we satisfy the normal condition? Is it that you can't hear my questions? Or you don't know the answer? I can't tell. Okay, if the sample size is big enough, and big enough is bigger than 30, or if the sample is, the sample seems normal. I don't know if this sample is normal. Certainly the sample size isn't big enough. It certainly looks symmetric. I'm going to give it an OK. Sample looks normal. Check mark. Last one. How do we satisfy the independent condition? Okay. Is the population 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 
It's a population at least 10 times the sample size. Do we think that this manufacturer will produce more than 200 of these screens? Yeah, I think it's reasonable. Okay, so there's step two. Step three, the actual calculations. Confidence interval equals to x bar plus or minus t star multiplied by f of x divided by n. And here we need our screen again. Um, lost it. So it looks like we have. 306.32 <coughs> plus or minus, and you looked up that Z star value, or sorry, T star value, which was what, 1.729, multiplied by the standard deviation, 36209, divided by the square root of 20. And I assume that you guys can get that into your calculator. I would like you to do that. Well, I'm going to do it and show you a trick. I always do the minus sign first. Someone answer that question for for me. Okay, so when I use the minus sign, I get the lower bound of the of the uh, confidence interval. Then I do a second enter. All that stuff is already there for me. Go ahead and change it to a plus sign. <coughs> so there's our confidence interval. Step four. This is, I'm going to write it down exactly the way I'd like you to write it down, please. And that concludes our four-step process. I believe I gave you a cheat sheet. I believe everything I wrote up on that board just now is on that sheet. Can you double check to make sure you have the cheat sheet of what you speak? Can I see it, Paul? Tomorrow's quiz, you may use that.
Right. Now, Katya, to your request from earlier, all the work that I did here, I could have allowed the calculator to do. Right? I want to show that to you right now. I do not require that you do this all by hand. I actually would rather have you use the calculator to do the calculations and save your mind muscle to make sure the conditions are met and that you interpret the results in an understandable way. On the calculator. Again, starting with the idea that we have the raw data in a list. I go under stats and tests. The name of the test, the name of the procedure that we just followed was called the T interval. And if we go down the list in stats tests, there it is. Now, this screen gives us two options. One of them has, or the two options are either, do we have the raw data in a list, or do we have a summary of the data in a statistical form? Meaning, I've got the sample mean and the sample, um, the sample standard deviation. In this particular instance, we have the data. Where is the data? It's in L1. And every single thing in the L1 represents exactly one data point. Do we want 95% confidence? No. no, we want 90% confidence. Calculate. How's that look compared to our answer? Good? Okay, that's one way. Now, the other way that I need you to make be aware of is that in some problems, instead of giving you the raw data, they give you just the statistics. For example, they give you that the X bar is 30632. They give you that the standard deviation is 36209. This procedure, I think it was eight. If we go to stats, it asks us, it asks us for that information. What is X? What is standard deviation? And because the standard error has an N in it, it asks us what the sample size is. We fill in those blanks. We say calculate. It gives us the confidence <coughs> interval. <laughs> now, I'm getting to it. Okay. That was only part of what Katya wanted to talk about. Now all of you know how to use the calculator to get to the calculation part a little bit easier. That does not excuse you from checking your conditions. It does not excuse you from interpreting the results at the end. Now, if you use the table and you give me an answer based on the table, you get full credit. If you use the calculator, you get full credit. This isn't about credit. This is about just plain old differences. How do you get to that assist? Stats, tests, and that's T interval. Sometimes the calculator will give you a different answer than the table procedure. Why is that? Remember, looking at your table, not every single degrees of freedom is represented, is it? It goes up by one, up to what, uh, 30? <clears throat> and then it goes up by tens, and then it goes up by what? Goes from by twenties, and then up by from a hundred to a thousand. 
when you are using the taper procedure, you may be forced to use a more conservative T-star value. As I said before, if you have a sample size of 45, that means you have 44 degrees of freedom. Your table will force you to go down to 40 degrees of freedom. The calculator doesn't have that restriction. The calculator can actually find the T star value for 44 degrees of freedom. And when you have more degrees of freedom, the T star value is a little bit small. So your confidence interval will be a little bit tight. The college board is okay with you using the, the table. If you wanted, if you wanted to find a, a strange T yeah. star value, yeah. you could indeed do inverse T. Right. right. It takes two inputs. That's so Okay. And I would actually rather not cover that one. Yeah. All right. If you would like to, I can talk to you individually. Okay. All right. So, let's conclude the lecture. So, this is the stuff that we already did. It's the T-star value that you already found. There's the calculation. Same answer that we got. There's their, in, there's their conclusion. All right. I said this before, I'll say it one more time. The conditions are there for a reason. If you fail to check your conditions, your answer is bogus. Unreliable. Don't do that. Of course, we're in the strange world of the classroom where all of a sudden someone says, you know what, I'm just going to say one of the conditions is wrong. And that means I don't have to do the rest of the problem because it will be a bogus answer. Well, the college board doesn't like that. So they have a middle ground. Check your conditions. If any of your conditions are bad, you use the moniker proceed with caution, meaning that we realize that the conclusion may be faulty, but I'm going to do it anyway just to show that I can do the procedure. You are recognizing that it's faulty, but we're going to proceed with caution. We're going to go ahead anyway. All right. Okay. This is especially true when there's a lack of normality. Again, how do we deal with the question of normality? Check the sample for normality, or make sure that your sample size is 30 or greater. Now, procedures that, do not, that are not sensitive to these conditions are called robust procedures. The T procedure is not robust. When conditions are violated, T procedures give faulty answers. We would like it to be robust. It is not. And this directly contradicts what I just said. Except it says, against non-normalities, except when there's outliers or strong skewness. Okay, so here's our, here's our normality check. We don't need the sample to be perfectly normal. We just don't want strong skewness or outliers. If we use the um, modified box plot, 
it will it will show us that there's outliers. All right. So. Quick statement again. Our data must be unbiased. Our sampling procedure must be unbiased. Or, again, the conclusions that we come to at the end are bogus. <laughs> okay. I believe this is on your sheet. Okay, so if you check your cheat sheet, here's how they're going to handle the normality question. They're actually going to break it into three parts. 30 and greater, you're good always. Between 15 and 30, all we have to say is watch out for outliers or skewness. When we're below 15, sample size must look normal. The sample distribution must look normal. Again, this is written on your scaffolding sheet which you may use on tomorrow's quiz. <laughs> Any questions? Does anyone require more time on this slide? Okay, and now we're to the summary. I don't think you need me to speak through the summary. Spare us. Yeah, spare me too. All right, let me turn off the recording.